Hello, thank you for joining me on Humanities Radio. I'm Janet Cunningham with the University of Utah College of Humanities, and today, in continuation of our celebration of Women's History Month, I'm speaking with Colleen McDaniel, Professor of History and the Sterling M. McMurrin Professor of Religious Studies, about her book, Sister Saints, Mormon Women Since the End of Polygamy. Her book offers a history of modern Mormon women and the often neglected stories of their experiences from polygamy to present day. prompted you to write Sister Saints? Well, as you mentioned, I'm a professor of religious studies here at the university. And within that broad field, I study American religions. And I've written a whole bunch of books on American religious history, books that focus on Catholics, books that focus on photography. I even wrote a book about heaven. And um, the book that I wrote before Sister Saints uh, focused on a Catholic woman and looked at Catholic reform. And since I had been living in Utah for 30 years, I thought it was about time that I looked at my own neighbors and uh, take my expertise in American religious history and try to make sense of Mormon women. What are some of the stereotypes about Latter-day Saint women that your book challenges? Well, I think there are two major stereotypes that I try to overturn in my book. And the first of those stereotypes is that Mormon women are conservative. And I try to show in my book how in the 19th century, Mormon women followed progressive causes and not simply liberal causes, but actually radical causes. And the most radical cause of the day was women's rights and women's right to vote. And so in the, in the book, I show how uh, Latter-day Saint women, especially through connections with the Relief Society, participated in um, the international movement to, to give women the right to vote. And the second stereotype that I try to challenge in the book is that uh, Mormonism is a male-dominated religion. And throughout the book, I try to show how women have their own agency and their own activities. And especially up until the 1970s in the Relief Society, Women uh, raised their own money. They made decisions about how they would spend that money. They were even involved in politics. And they ran their own very influential magazine. And so these were various activities that um, tried to show that at least up until uh, the end of the um, of the 20th century, women were were very involved in in public activities as well as doing things in the home. So I'm really interested in learning more about um, these progressive movements and how um, they're in what their lives were like throughout these different movements in history. But first, I want to talk about what was life like for the women just as polygamy ended, because that's kind of where we're kind of starting, correct? Right. So um, the second chapter of my book looks a little bit about uh, polygamy and the stresses that polygamy placed on on Mormon women. And one of the interesting resources that I used uh, were a series of interviews done of the children of polygamists. And when you read the stories of the children, you get a very different perspective on polygamy women who became polygamists were were quite, um, most of them were quite enthusiastic about living a polygamous lifestyle because they were committed to LDS principles and polygamy was a part of the religion. So when they converted to the religion, they also converted to a new way of having a family. The children, on the other hand, they hadn't converted. They hadn't had a, a religious experience. And so they saw polygamy in a very different light than their, than their mothers and fathers did. 
And for the most part, they were not terribly enthusiastic about polygamy. Many of them were one of, of many children. It wouldn't be unusual to have, you know, 20 brothers and sisters. And the men who were supposed to care for these families oftentimes uh, had a rough job of it. Even though they wanted to take care of their families, just financially, it was, it was difficult. What happened uh, when polygamy ended was there was no clear instructions given about how families should should exist. Some men actually decided to continue polygamy and they they took their wives either to Canada or to Mexico. And sometimes they even left wives in Utah uh, and took their favorite wives or the ones that they got along with, they took those to places like Mexico. And sometimes it was the youngest wife, uh, not just because she might have been the prettiest one, but also because she would have been the one to care for the men as they aged. And that meant that other wives were left in Utah caring for, for their children. And so the children found uh, this life to be, a, to be a difficult one. So throughout, so from the end of polygamy until now, Mormon women, their, their lives and, ex- and experiences have gone through a spectrum of changes. So what were kind of the significant movements that you were talking about earlier or moments in history that changed these roles and experiences? Well, if we go back to um, the women's rights movement of the turn of the century, as you know, since we're celebrating uh, last year, we celebrated the 100th year of women having the federal uh, right to vote in 2020. They got the vote in 1920. Uh, After women got the vote, it was a big question about how would they behave? Uh, Would they be a force in politics with with all of these women now voting? And what happened was uh, the women voted just like the men did. Some voted uh, for Democrats and some voted for Republicans and some didn't vote at all. And some voted the way their husbands wanted them to vote. And some of them uh, had their own ideas about how politics should should uh, um, be performed. And so actually what you see is great diversity in the 1920s uh, once women get the vote. They didn't vote as a bloc. And so what that meant was that politicians, male politicians, could basically just ignore the women because they they weren't a force in politics because they were they were very uh, diffuse. So beginning around that time, the 1920s, right after World War One, there ten, uh, there was a, a conservative movement across the nation in in politics. A lot of it was a response. Um, uh, towards the uh, Bolshevik revolution in Russia. And so there was a great fear that something like this, like socialism, might come to the United States. So historians call this the anti-radical movement. And many um, Latter-day Saint male leaders became involved in this more conservative outlook towards society. Whereas the women in the Relief Society continued their more progressive orientation because they had been um, hanging out with basically uh, progressive non-Mormon women because they were part of the suffrage movement. So by the time you get then into the 1930s, um, the the male leaders begin to slowly um, restrict the public activities of the Relief Society. And perhaps the most important thing was that during the Depression era, the church decided to take over the welfare system from the women and to, and to uh, focus it on the priesthood and to have all of the welfare activities organized by men. So although women still produced much of the labor, they did the canning, they made the clothes, they distributed food to to needy people, it was the male church leaders who uh, decided how the church welfare system would be set up. And this made a a big change. It, It took one of the very important 
elements of uh, w women's uh, leadership away from the Relief Society. And it began really uh, the shift of power from the uh, women to the men. And can you talk a little bit um, about some of the women we'll meet in this book or who readers will meet in their, this book and their contribution to the church? Well, I think what I'd like to do is uh, just talk about one woman. And um, I want to talk about her because she is one of the unsung heroes in the book. She's not the famous women, a woman like uh, Emmeline Wells, but she is really famous at, in her own right. And she also points to a really important change that has occurred in the church. And her name is Ayanda Sitzanhe, and she is from South Africa. And I was very lucky, um, thanks to support from the University of Utah, to be able to travel to South Africa and to live there uh, for a while and interview LDS women about their lives and their history. And Ayanda was one of these really special women that I, I met there. Like many uh, South Afri Black South African women, she had ex her family had experienced apartheid, uh, which is a form of really severe racial segregation. And because of that, she had had a very difficult time growing up. Her, her father deserted the family. Her mother had to support many children. Uh, her sisters oftentimes married uh, quite young and then had families of their own without the support, support of men. But she had um, converted and had found within the LDS community a really supportive organization. She went on a mission to Botswana. She had American missionary companions. And she came back to uh, Johannesburg. She worked at the uh, missionary training center. She eventually married a former missionary. And she became a really strong leader within her church. And I, I want to point her out as, a, as a, a, major, a major figure because she indicates a shift in, in, uh, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints from the 1960s and 70s uh, into the present. So as you know, there was a, a change in the policy towards um, the priesthood in the late 1970s where uh, men of African descent could become uh, priests within the, within the church, and that expanded the missionary activities. And so when missionary activities began to expand, you get a, a, a diverse responses to the LDS message. And those diverse responses begin to, to um, uh, weaken the sharp polar, uh, polarization between the conservatives and the liberals that you had in Utah, uh, especially in the 1980s and 1990s. And so this, this international church uh, uh, is a very different kind of church and women's positions in it are very different than they were in in utah that was colleen mcdaniel professor of history and the sterling m mcmurrin professor of religious studies sister saints can be found on amazon for more information about the university of utah college of humanities please visit humanities.utah.edu